State funding of K-12 education in Wisconsin is critical to the operation of school districts and to Wisconsin's future. There are some significant education proposals in Governor Evers' budget, and we'll talk about them with Dr. Jill Underly, State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Dr. Underly, welcome to Connect MKE. Thank you so much, Denise. Happy to be here. Governor Evers has proposed an historic $2.6 billion in funding increases for schools. The way that breaks out is that it could provide an additional $650 per pupil in funding for every K-12 student in the state by the 24-25 school year. What would that amount of money let school districts do that they're not able to do now? That would be a historic amount of money for schools. And I hate to say that it's historic because we've been doing so much with so little. And our school districts, you know, certainly with the costs of inflation, they would be able to, you know, provide better salaries for teachers and staff. So not just teachers, but like bus drivers, custodians, secretaries, all, you know, all the staff. Um, they would certainly be able to make needed repairs on their buildings, just like anybody's home, you know, you think things go, you know, things wear out after time, like roofs or, you know, um, certainly siding, things along those lines. They are constantly having to keep up their buildings. I mean, those are important investments, but then they'd also be able to invest in the programs for kids. Um, you think about literacy and math and you think about curriculum, um, programs like band and music and art. Um, all of that takes funding. And when we lose funding, like we have, you know, it hasn't kept up, you know, the past decade or so, um, you know, we lose teachers, we lose, um, you know, those different programs, and we certainly aren't keeping up our facilities like we could. One area where there would be a, a big investment is in mental health. Enough money that every school district in the state would be able to have mental health professionals on staff in schools. How important is that, especially as we are still seeing the impact of kids and for that matter, staff coming out of COVID-19? Well, mental health was an issue before COVID. And so when you think about anxiety and you think about other mental health um, issues, they were compounded during COVID. And when you think about also the shortage of staff, um, mental health, aspect is, you know, not just for kids, you know, certainly we want to put the programs in the buildings because that's where the kids are, but it's also for the staff too, who are having to manage a lot of mental health issues among the different students, but then also having to sub in for other staff when there's staff shortages. And so that impacts staff mental health too. So this would be a huge investment. Um, when you talk to parents like I do, the number one thing parents tell me they're worried about in their schools is mental health. Um, they're thinking about their own kids and our data supports supports that concern. Um, so where the kids are, are in schools. And so if we're going to get the services to kids, we need to push those services into schools. And that's why that investment would be a, an incredible game changer for our kids. You're right that there are so many studies and surveys that talk about the poor state of mental health for our young people now. Is it just a reality in terms of where we are that if we're going to adequately educate our children and help them reach their fullest potential, we have got to make that investment in making sure that their mental health needs are met and their mental health begins to improve? Yeah, and you know, when you think about when you're ready to be your best self, whether it's at your job or for your family, um, your health is important. I mean, it's not just your physical health, right? When we think about those kinds of things or just even like having having an illness, right? But you're also mentally, you need to be in the right place for that. Um, there's a lot of things that contribute to mental health. You think about things at home like food insecurity or the stresses, like if a parent loses their job or if a family is going to lose their home, Um there's certainly lots of anxiety around school safety among kids, too. When you are reading the news or when you, you know, find there's all these conflicts in the world, kids worry about a lot of things. They're exposed to a lot more, um, I think, than when we were kids. And so that is impacting them rather acutely. Um, coming out of COVID, 
I mean, there was so much um, anxiety in COVID and during the pandemic and kids, you know, seeing the conflict, the disagreement in their communities, um, you know, that that didn't help. Right. And then you think about in the school building um, when there's shortages of staff, when they don't have a teacher, you know, because they couldn't find a sub or maybe they couldn't find a teacher. And so they're starting off the school year on uncertain footing with somebody. I mean, those relationships are very important, too. And when we take people and move them around or we can't find somebody to staff a, a certain position, that all impacts kids. I mean, they're very aware of so much going on and anything that we can do to help them be them their best selves so that they can do their job, which is to learn um, and become, you know, protect, productive citizens in the state. Um, that's what we're supposed to do. And, and that's why the funding would be very, very important. The GOP has signaled, um, the GOP legislature, legislators have signaled that they are not really behind this idea of the amount of money, not just in schools, but overall, that Governor Evers wants to put into mental health funding. Without that money, are school districts going to be able to meet the mental health needs of students? No, they won't. Um, they will do the best that they can because that's what schools do. Um, and if we can find services, you know, if we can certainly get people um, through like contracts or, you know, outside services that way, we'll, we will do the best we can. But that mental health funding was intended to be able to provide services to kids and meet the, the current needs. Because um, right now we're just, you know, making do. And that's not fair. I mean, the, the, the issues that I, you know, have with how we fund schools is that it's not really, it's, it, how do I say this? The issues that I have is that it's the largest expenditure that we have in state government, right, is public education. And that's for a reason. And it's because when you think about everything that public education provides, it's that whole idea that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we can push in, you know, and get kids the best academic programming, meet their mental health needs, make sure that they have food in their bellies. And the outcome is that they're going to be productive, lifelong citizens in Wisconsin. And that's that's why, you know, it's really important that we continue to, you know, educate people, educate community members, educate legislators as to why funding our schools um, to what they they need is so important. Let's talk a little bit about nutrition because there is a proposal in that K-12 budget that would provide fully funding school breakfast and lunch at no cost to public and independent uh, charter schools across the state. Um, how, how, how do you feel about that, moving, about that moving forward? It's something that has been done in some communities and some school districts like Milwaukee Public Schools for, for some time. Yeah, and I think some communities they, I mean, they certainly, if they can afford to do it, they do it because they know that the the outcome of that is extremely important. When all kids have access to quality, nutritious breakfast and lunch programs and milk programs um, during the school day, those kids are ready to learn. I mean, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, a colleague said this to me the other day. They said, well, on the days we have our test, our statewide test, we feed the kids in the morning. Um, regardless, right? Because we want them to do well on the test. And I'm like, that is so true. And it's absurd. I mean, we want kids to be their best selves every day. Yet we're willing to do it on the day of the standardized test um, because we want them to do well. But we provide a lot of things for kids. You know, we certainly, because we want them to be ready to learn and to do well in school. Um, transportation, for example, we provide transportation and school buses. Um, regardless of ability to pay for gas or to get your kids to school. We provide textbooks to kids. We provide curriculum materials um, regardless, right? And, you know, that's where I feel like we need to get to the point in the conversation where food is a right. Um, and if we want kids to be their best selves and be able to learn and, you know, certainly it will help with mental health and relieve some of the anxiety there too. Um, I think we should be doing it. Other states are doing it. And, you know, certainly I, I hope Wisconsin is not far behind. 
Roughly 15% of students in the state receive some kind of special education services, yet special education has historically been underfunded. That begins to change with Governor Evers' proposal. Tell us a little bit about that funding. Yeah, um, special education is a right. Um, students need accommodations for disabilities. Um, that is a federal law that we are to provide them. And schools are doing a fantastic job of doing that. The, the problem is with that is that those services are billed differently. Um, and the state reimburses the school districts for providing that service as part of the service of providing for a public education in Wisconsin. Um, but they reimburse it at a rate depending on the, you know, poverty of the district. So it can be a reimbursement of 28 cents on the dollar to maybe around 30 cents on the dollar. And so the, that additional expense that is not reimbursed, the school district has to pay for it. And again, it's, you know, they, they do. They, they provide that, um, that service because it's our, you know, our responsibility and we would not do it any other way. But the difference is because we're not getting that reimbursement, um, school districts have to borrow from other programs within um, the school district. So maybe they are putting off, putting on a roof. Maybe they are not going to hire an extra um, reading teacher or uh, dean of students or any of those things. And so the way it works is really unfortunate. Like that's why if we were to adopt the proposal in the governor's budget, it gets us to 45 percent and then 60 percent reimbursement and that frees up that those dollars therefore the school district won't have to transfer and they can use it towards um, you know all kids and in, in programming for all kids. A common theme as we've had uh, our discussion today has been the important role that educators play. Wisconsin does not graduate enough educators from its schools of education across the state to meet our need. There are some things in the budget, though, that try to address that effort. Yeah, there are. Um, certainly, when you think about teaching and the profession of teaching, there's a lot of training that goes into it. And individuals invest a lot of themselves, you know, in, in acquiring that education and, and a lot of time, you know, to hone um, that craft. But the, the, the problem, unfortunately, is that once they get into student teaching, that's an unpaid internship. And teachers are often, you know, student teachers are traveling, you know, distances. You know, they can't afford to put gas in their cars or they have to take second jobs um, in order to live while they're, they're um, pay their living expenses while they're student teaching. So this was uh, an attempt to pay student teachers. It was also a way to invest in individuals who are already working in schools, for example, teaching aides or assistants. Um, who are really good with kids and desire to become teachers, and it gives them a pathway for the district to grow their own um, individuals into the teaching profession. Um, it would particularly be helpful in rural school districts and urban school districts, too. Um, so there were a couple of those. It was also, a, there were provisions to invest in, for example, future teacher, um, future teacher clubs. Like we have, you know, for future business, you know, like through other programs like DECA or, you know, we have like um, health professional clubs in high school for high school students. This was a way to invest in future teachers um, and, and get them experiences and, and help them take the coursework um, that they could then transfer, you know, to college or to tech college in order to get on that pathway to becoming a teacher. There are so many ways that we can do this. It's just that this profession, for whatever reason, um, has been underfunded in a lot of different ways. And we need to get our heads back on straight and say, look, if we're going to have all these other professions, you know, business, accounting, health professions, the individuals who are training these individuals are teachers. And so we need to invest in teachers so that we can make sure that we are a strong society and strong economy down the line. And is, is that part of what we need to do? Do we also need to figure out ways in which teachers 
also see themselves as, as valued, see their opinions and their credentials as being valued and to, to, for us to really see them as what they are, and that is true professionals. It, absolutely. I think it's a societal problem. And I, you know, it's like I think about it this way. If there was a shortage of doctors, right, or if there were a shortage of nurses, or if there were a shortage of people working on our roads or building homes, I mean, it's like we certainly like look or a shortage of police officers. I mean, if there's these kinds of things, I mean, we have to start thinking about teachers as part of the public good. I mean, they provide public services. They educate the kids. They make sure that our society and our democracy is sustainable down the future. And it's like we have to, as a society, begin appreciating that. And and part of that is pay, but it's also the respect, um, you know, that these individuals deserve. I mean, for the work that they do day in and day out. Um, and I think that anybody you talk to and you say, can you tell me who was your favorite teacher? Or why was this person your favorite teacher? Or who was the individual who made the most impact on your life when you were growing up that maybe wasn't your parent or a family member? They're going to say it's a teacher. And we have to acknowledge the fact that these individuals are, are good people who are trying to make our world a better place. And they do it because they love kids and they love, you know, they love democracy. And, and it's really unfortunate that our society hasn't come around to that idea yet. And they're often, you know, cast aside. Well, there is a lot going on in K-12 education in Wisconsin, a lot in the budget, and we really appreciate you being here with us, Dr. Underly, to walk us through what's there. And quite frankly, um, what's at risk if we don't appropriately fund our, our public schools? Thank you. You bet. Thanks. That's all for this week's Connect MKE. I'm your host, Denise Calloway. Make sure you tune in to our primetime special, Connect MKE Conversations on Race. It's all about conversations that matter. Thanks for joining us and be well.